Joining us now via Skype is the Regional Director, East and Southern Africa at Amnesty International, Depros Muchena. Thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us. Um, we talk about uh, COVID-19 having um, really brought to the fore uh, a lot of these uh, issues. Uh, I just wonder though, when I was reading through this report now, some of it, it sounds as if this is something that we've been dealing with for a long time. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Peter, for, for having me. Um, what the report covers is the, the year that has just gone, 2020, which is the year in which the global community dealt with the devastating impact of COVID-19. And what we assess across the world is that the global pandemic amplified uh, pre-existing inequalities, which themselves are a function of the failed policies of neglect, which had been built over decades uh, by countries that sought to pursue policies that did not put poor people at the center uh, of economic policy. So as it arrived on this continent, it affected the least uh, capacitated, the lowest on the social ladder, and those most vulnerable, including refugees, women, unemployed people, those in the formal economy. And across the world, this picture of inequality, discrimination, and neglect uh, is the story that uh, human rights movement uh, tried to spotlight in this report. So mismanagement, poor policies is one thing, but we're also seeing deliberate abuse of uh, this difficult time of the pandemic. Indeed, uh, there was uh, across the, the world uh, and certainly on the continent in sub-Saharan Africa, we documented uh, 35 countries in which we conclude that there was a significant weaponization of the pandemic to further assault human rights and achieve political objectives. Uh, across many countries, uh, the story of authoritarian resurgence or authoritarian consolidation, which is essentially taking advantage of a crisis, legislate and then deploy those laws, regulations selectively to punish opponents, journalists, media, political opposition groups, and others that are considered critics of the government. So pandemic itself gets weaponized to achieve political ends instead of using the pandemic to address uh, the disproportionate impact that many of the populations of the continent first, including also populations of the world. And that is something that we are really spotlighting. We're also spotlighting the very dangerous uh, uh, conditions under which frontline health workers were subjected to. Uh, a lot of them died as a result. We documented cases in South Africa, where by August last year, about 240 health workers had died from the pandemic in Ghana, uh, 2,600. Uh, health workers had been infected by the virus by July last year and six had died. And that was pretty much the case everywhere in Sudan, in Zimbabwe, in Mozambique. Those who were on the front lines, those least protected, were on the most vicious assault of the pandemic as a result, once again, of poor investment in PPEs as well as the wider public health uh, system of the continent. And so human rights violations in that kind of context become even more excessive, putting so many people at risk. So this report, I guess, illuminates that which was known, but uh, perhaps the pandemic really putting a magnifying glass on some of these issues. How do we start to fix this? How do we start to reverse some of these poor practices as the vaccines start getting rolled out and we can see some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of a post-COVID era? That's a, that's a great question. I think it's a question we are contending with. I, it's, it's important first to put principles of human rights at the center of the vaccine rollout program so that you don't discriminate against any groups uh, that do not have power, standing uh, and belonging. Uh, second, it is important to mobilize international cooperation and international assistance in order to equalize those countries at the bottom that are unable to mobilize additional resources because they lack fiscal space within their economic systems to generate money that can be deployed to rebuild 
their economy, health systems as well as provide for vaccines. Uh, you know, what's happening, Peter, is that if you look at 2020, uh, in the global north, the stimulus packages that were spent to mobilize response uh, in domestic arenas amounted to something over 10 trillion uh, euros that was just spent in the global north to mobilize domestic responses. Uh, overseas development assistance at the same time, which flows to the global south, sits at 250 billion. That inequality in resource allocation determines where we are on this continent and others and where the global north is. Now to address a global pandemic of the proportion we have here, international cooperation means tackling questions such as the global debt crisis that affects most of our countries in the south, ensuring that we have something called the social protection fund that the ILO and others have been muting so that those who are uh, dislocated and those who are affected by the vagaries of the pandemic in future are able to be protected from a fund that is shared across the countries. This is also happening in the context of uh, the challenge of climate change. So a just inclusive recovery must also look at the impact of climate change across a continent such as ours, which is taking additional resources from governments to respond to cyclones, mm -hmm. to locusts uh, that are invading East Africa and other forms of global warming impacts that we are dealing with. So it's a challenging period for the globe and it requires global leadership, uh, which has been lacking for a number of years now. Yeah, global leadership. And uh, one gets a sense that multilateralism uh, is required now much more than ever before countries, regions having to work together. Absolutely. You saw uh, the last four years of the Trump presidency was directed at assaulting the international human rights protection system, threats to defund the United Nations and uh, withdrawals from uh, strategic institutions that are charged with providing the kind of global leadership you need to address the pandemic. I think what we need is to see countries come together uh, to support multilateralism once again. But at a regional level, uh, we also need to see this playing out in the African Union uh, within sub-regional mechanisms like SADC. We need regional strong, robust responses that integrate people, that harnesses social and economic policies so that the building up better, the building back better, the recovery from COVID-19 does not happen in one country at the expense of the other, because we know the pandemic moves across borders, whether we like it or not. We also have to tackle the problem of vaccine nationalism that we have seen where countries in the north have been holding the vaccine beyond their population needs at a time when other countries do not have. And this has created a scramble for the vaccine uh, at a time when we know that we're also talking about debt cancellation and debt relief for countries of the South. So we really need to see this robust leadership displayed uh, at a global level. But nationally, we really need to uh, liquidate the practice of using crisis as opportunities for consolidating repression, as we have seen in Southern Africa. Deborah Mchena, Regional Director, East and Southern Africa at Amnesty International. Many thanks to you. Thank you very much, Peter. All right, so that's uh, the regional uh, director, Eastern Southern Africa for Amnesty International, Depros Muchena, speaking to us uh, about uh, the COVID era and uh, the onslaught on human rights uh, and uh, human rights abuses uh, across the world.